All right, good afternoon and welcome to the second Retina Australia webinar for 2020, Gene Therapy, Clinical Trials and New Developments in IRD Research. My name is Sally Turnbull and I'm the Administrative Officer for Retina Australia and I will be the facilitator of this webinar today. I'll now hand over to Robert Kraft, Board Member of Retina Australia, to introduce our speakers. Yeah, on behalf of Retina Australia, I have the, uh, the great honour to introduce two very gifted and talented doctors. They'll be sharing with you shortly uh, their, their findings and the gene therapy studies and the clinical, the, the numerous clinical trials that they'll be sort of putting together shortly. Uh, also, the, um, they, they're based in, uh, in Victoria, but have a, a world of knowledge and we'll be sharing that knowledge, part of the knowledge with us uh, shortly. The, the two presenters, the first is uh, Dr. Lauren Ayton, is uh, currently collaborating with Dr. Tom Edwards and Professor Keith Martin on exciting new gene therapy programs for the inherited retinal degeneration. And her research group is also working on non-invasive and low vision interventions, such as electronic aids and sensory uh, substitutized devices. So we'll learn a little bit more about that from Dr. Lauren Ayton. And joining Dr. Lauren Ayton will be Dr. Tom Edwards. And he's a Melbourne based uh, Vitorenal surgeon, I hope I pronounced it correctly, and he leads a research team investigating the retinal gene therapy at the University of Melbourne, which is affiliated with the Centre of Eye Research Australia, and that's uh, based in the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital. He is also a senior mm -hmm. clinician in the, uh, the Royal Victorian Eye and, and Ear Hospital in the Ocular Genetics clinic. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Lauren Ayton to start the presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. It's a huge pleasure, pleasure for us to be able to share the research that we're doing. And we are particularly focusing today on gene therapy. Um, as a previous recipient of Retina Australia funding as well, I wanted to really Put out a personal thank you to you all for your support. Uh, it really does make a big difference to the researchers. So I'm going to share my screen. I do have some slides. So while that's happening, um, I'll give you a little bit of background about what we are doing at the Centre for Eye Research Australia and the University of Melbourne. So Tom and I are obviously very interested in inherited retinal diseases. And uh, I've met many of you, see some familiar names on this list um, in my previous work where I was working with the Bionic Eye Group in Melbourne as well. We are now focusing very strongly on gene therapy and stem cell treatments, which are sort of coming down the pipeline. And why we wanted to talk to you today was to give you an update on what treatments are available now and what treatments will be available in the coming years. It is definitely a question that we get asked quite a lot. So as a bit of an overview, uh, what we will talk about today is a little bit of uh, background about what gene therapy actually means. We're going to talk a bit about the history of gene therapy and it's very exciting for us because ophthalmology is really leading the field for gene therapy. So the first ever gene therapy that was applied directly to humans was for uh, RPE65 gene mutations, so for labour congenital amaurosis. And so it is really a huge field um, of development at the moment. We're going to talk a little bit about benefits and risks of gene therapy and I'd like to upfront put the caveat here that obviously if you're considering any of these treatments you do need to talk to your doctor about what the, the potential pros and cons of such treatments might be. Obviously we're all very interested in who's suitable so we're going to talk a bit about what the uh, upcoming treatments are for, uh, what particular types of inherited retinal disease, and we're happy to answer some questions on those as well. But we wanted to really let people know what trials are coming soon, and also answer questions if people are interested in how you can become involved in our research. 
So in terms of vision restoration therapies, this is a field which has rapidly moved in the last 10 years. So it's gone from there really not being many options when you had lost significant vision um, to now there being bionic eyes available commercially on the market uh, in the US and in Europe. Sensory substitution devices that uh, Robert mentioned just before. So these are things like uh, devices where you wear a camera which takes a picture of your environment and then turns that into an audio signal that you can hear or potentially a tactile sensation where you can feel the, the visual environment around you. And obviously we want to talk today um, at length about gene therapy. Coming closely behind, there's other treatment options. So stem cell therapies are being trialled in, in clinic, clinical trials um, around the world, but they're not available commercially yet. There are neuroprotective devices. So these are electronic devices which help to keep the retina healthy. And these can either be applied to the front of the eye or potentially to the back of the eye. And there's also another treatment called optogenetics, which is actually a form of gene therapy where we try to change the function of some of the cells in the retina to become light sensitive. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. So the take home with this is that there are lots of things coming down the pipeline and it's happening quite quickly. So in terms of talking, what we're going to talk about today is, is gene therapy. We are looking at either correcting a defective gene. So in a lot of inherited retinal diseases, there's a gene that has a mistake in it. And that means that the proteins that are produced from that gene are not working as they should. So one form of gene therapy is to try and correct those gene mutations. There's also gene therapy that looks at identifying a protective gene. So this can be a bit more generic and something that can help to protect the retina. We are also working with colleagues that are developing cell therapies. And in these techniques, you can either take, take, take cells from an individual um, and adapt those cells to then place back into the eye, or you can uh, use donor cells as well. I'm not gonna go into detail today about stem cell therapy, but this is another potential option down the track. As Leighton mentioned in the, um, the AGM today, the exciting thing is that the future is really here. So Lux Sterner has very recently been approved for use in Australia. So this is a gene therapy for a particular gene mutation for a condition called labor congenital amaurosis. So it's a subtype of RP. It is fairly rare. So it affects about 2% of people that have RP. But the exciting thing is that the clinical trials for this treatment have shown that it can slow down the progression of vision loss. And in some cases, it actually improves vision for patients as well. Now, before we get stuck into how gene therapy works, I wanted to give a little bit of a refresher of the anatomy of the eye. So we're obviously all very interested in the retina and the retina is really like the film in the camera. So it is at the back of the eye and it's a um, layer, of, it's got multiple layers of cells which translate vision that comes into the eye into electrical signals that are then passed from your eye back to your brain by the optic nerve. So in the retina itself, it's actually flipped around from what you think it would normally be. So the cells that react to the light are actually right at the back of the retina. So the light goes through the retina, is picked up by what are called the photoreceptors. They then change that light into electrical signals, which go back through the retina and end up at the ganglion cells. And these cells then take it via the nerve back to the brain. So when something goes wrong, so when there's a, a gene mutation, um, we have a few different options in terms of therapy. So augmentation is a form of gene therapy where we simply replace the defective gene. So this is in cases where we know what gene is not working properly and we can use a usually a virus to take a correct version of that gene and inject it into the eye. Gene editing is a little bit more um, yeah, uh, complicated in some degrees, but also has great potential because in gene editing, you're actually editing 
the defective gene within the patient's own cells. And many of you may have heard of CRISPR technology. And this is a way of basically cutting out the incorrect part of the gene and then replacing it with the right version. I briefly mentioned at the start optogenetics, and this is where we use gene therapy to change the function of the cells that are left in the retina. So often what happens in inherited retinal disease is that the photoreceptors in the retina are lost, but some of the other cells are relatively intact. So the idea with optogenetics is that you change some of those inner retinal cells to make them become light sensitive and replace the photoreceptors. Now, one of the real take home messages with gene therapy is it usually will only work if the photoreceptors are still present. And the most recent data suggests that about two thirds of the photoreceptors need to be still in the eye in order for gene therapy to work. We think that those photoreceptors can be sick, so they don't need to be working perfectly, but it seems there is a, a criterion of number of cells for, for gene therapy to be successful. Now, I'm not gonna give you too much of a history lesson, but I really wanted to uh, point out how new this field is. So the first gene therapy trial was actually done in 1990, so it was only 30 years ago. And that was for a condition known as uh, SCID, which is severe um, combined immunodeficiency. And this is often referred to as the boy in the bubble disease. So these are children that have basically no immune system of their own and they become very ill very quickly. So this was a huge advance for the field. So these children were treated with gene therapy. And in fact, Mr. Silver, who was the, the first patient to get this gene therapy is actually now a patient advocate and doing very, very well 30 years on. From then, uh, cancer gene therapies were developed and HIV uh, therapies were developed, but all of these treatments involved taking patient cells out, treating them and then giving the cells back to the patient. So it was a really large advance when the gene therapies for eye disease were developed because these are ones that are actually injected straight into the eye. So the first trial of, of a gene therapy, again, for labor congenital amaurosis was in 2007. And from then it led obviously to a number of more trials and the regulatory processes to go towards commercialization. And it was then approved in 2017 uh, in the US and very excitingly has been approved in Australia in the last few weeks. In uh, parallel, there's obviously been work going on into other forms of treatment for labor congenital amaurosis. So uh, the CRISPR gene editing that we were talking about before um, commenced clinical trials last year. And there are obviously a big uh, raft of treatments that are following close behind. And, and Tom will talk more about those in detail. So why the eye? Why, why is ophthalmology leading this field? And the reason really is because the eye is a great enclosed space. So we can treat the eye and know that because of the physical barriers, um, the gene therapy is gonna stay there and not spread to the rest of the body. The eye itself has really good immune properties that help with gene therapy. So there's no direct blood supply to the outer retina. There's no lymph glands in your eyes. And the eye itself actually produces molecules that help gene therapy to work. But probably the most promising reason for the eye being a good gene therapy site is that the cells in your retina don't divide after you're born. So if we can treat the cells that are in the retina that are not working properly, um, we think that the effect should probably persist indefinitely because the cells are not dividing and, and being replaced. So I'm going to pass on to Tom now, who's going to talk a little bit more in detail about the benefits and risks of gene therapy and tell you about some of the trials that are coming up. Uh, thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your time and interest in what we've got to say today. And thanks, uh, Leighton and Rosemary, for the kind invitation. Um, so as Lauren uh, pointed out, we're really uh, at an exciting 
stage uh, in ophthalmology in being the, the leaders of this exciting technology. Uh, and also, uh, finally, being able to provide some hope, uh, at least, for patients who up until now have sadly um, not had much in the way uh, to look forward to from a treatment, treatment point of view. And whilst there's still a long way to go, we're, we've started down this exciting pathway. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, there's good evidence to suggest that gains in visual acuity from a one-off treatment of gene therapy are sustained in the long term. Uh, the original uh, dogs, in fact, that were treated before any humans uh, with the early, in the early development of Lux Sterna are still showing benefits from uh, that. And uh, we're talking now over sort of 15 years ago, I think, for those dogs. So, so that's all very encouraging that we think it would be a, a one-time treatment, uh, although really it remains to be seen as more patients are tr being treated, but theoretically it should be a once-off treatment. Uh, critically, of course, there needs to be some cells left in the retina to treat. It's not going to be any good if you've uh, got such advanced disease that this, those, those re photoreceptors are, have already degenerated. Um, and it's possible that by rescuing some of the dysfunctional cells, there may be some rescue or, or boost in vision. And we have seen some evidence of that in clinical trials. Uh, now, uh, in some ways, it's a relatively simple surgical procedure, but in other ways, uh, it's the most uh, uncertain in terms of reliability of the whole process. We know the virus works. We know it gets into cells. We know that from all the preclinical work. Probably the big variable in the whole pipeline of, 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 of the uh, procedure is the surgery to some extent, and we're improving that all the time with new technology for performing special scans during the operation, and people just becoming more familiar with the treatment. And, but you know, it is still a surgical procedure and there are, there are risks associated with that, but by and large, it, no different to uh, any other eye surgery operation. Um, so on the next slide, um, disadvantages of gene therapy. Well, I mean, probably the big one is the cost. Um, but a bit like when the first plasma television came out and they were really, really super expensive, it will over time become cheaper as more, uh, as the more com competition enters the market and uh, governments become more familiar with negotiating with pharmaceutical companies. So I think over time we'll see the cost come down, but you, you will, will certainly would have heard that it's an eye-wateringly eye expensive treatment. Uh, you know, from the pharmaceutical company's side, they've spent m many, many, many years developing these things and there's not many patients to treat, so they want to make their buck out of it. But at the same time, they can't, they can't make it, you know, sort of the cost of a house. People just aren't going to be able to afford it and governments won't be able to subsidise it. So we're in these early stages of negotiations between pharmaceutical companies and governments and how, how it's all going to be paid for. And I'm sure in the end, um, you know, things will come out in favour of, of the patient, which, of course, is how it should be. Um, the other thing uh, is that at, at this stage, the strategy being used, which is to replace each uh, gene with a working copy of a gene, at least that's the simplest gene therapy in its simplest form, um, you know, that requires a different treatment for every genetic cause of inherited retinal degeneration. So that, you know, therefore requires a full translational pipeline from, you know, early development of a, that particular particular treatment for that particular genetic cause of IRD. So it, it's not a one size fits all approach is I guess the point I'm trying to make. But again, as these, as these systems uh, become more streamlined, it may be that in the future you'll be sat in a, in a genetics clinic and you know, the, uh, the ophthalmologist will sort of punch in an order for your particular gene and you know, it'll arrive in a few months time and off you go into theater and have that gene delivered to your retina. I mean, that, that's sort of the, the potential future as, as things are progressing, but we're, we're a long way from that yet. And at this stage, it's just Lux Sterner, which is to treat one particular variety of IRD that has, has approval. But of course, there are others coming down the pipeline. I mean, from the safety point of view, really, it has an excellent safety profile. You know, the adeno associated virus, which is the vector that's used to deliver the, the uh, transgenes, has a, a very good safety record now. It's been delivered to, uh, you know, hundreds of 
eyes in, in the context of clinical trials now, and, and we really know it's very safe. But of course, the long-term um, effects, I suppose, are not um, really known yet. And, and the only way to know that is to start putting it into, um, into eyes. And, and we feel confident that we've done as much from the safety side as can be possible. And it's now time to get on and, and, uh, and do these clinical trials uh, because the benefits are, are really there to be, to be had. Uh, so, um, you know, how has it performed? Well, to, to give you a, a quick sort of description of the surgery, we, we're trying to get this um, very small volume of fluid, which contains the virus, it's about 0.1 of a mil. We're trying to get that underneath the retina. And as Lauren said, the retina is a bit like the sort of wallpaper on the back of the eye. And, uh, and, 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 and I use the analogy of wallpaper instead of paint because you, you can sort of pull wallpaper off a wall. And, and the retina is the same. You would have heard people getting a retinal detachment. That's when the retina comes away from the wall of the eye uh, due to a little tear in the retina. And what you're actually trying to cause is a little mini retinal detachment just in the center of the retina. Uh, and that's, that's the space into which the, the virus is injected. And that's really the, the, the goal of the surgery to safely detach a little blister, if you like, of retina in the back of the eye. Uh, and that's done with a very, very, very fine cannula, finer than a human hair, and then um, into that space, uh, that blister of, of saline that's put under the retina is injected the gene therapy. And if you do a scan of the eye the next day, it's all pumped down and been absorbed and the retina is reattached. Um, so it's a, it's a temporary sort of little mini detachment to get the retina, to get the uh, virus underneath the retina. And it can be performed, um, you know, in, in, a, in an eye hospital under local anaesthetic even, and the procedure, you know, once you get started, really is certainly less than an hour in most cases. Uh, but of course, you're dealing with abnormal retina that's, you know, essentially diseased. And uh, that's not to be taken lightly. And um, certainly we're very, very careful and look for, for any stretching or potential um, uh, cause for uh, damage to the retina while we're doing this. So um, here's a little video. Um, and it's got some commentary, so I'll stay quiet. Um, don't know if you'll hear it, um, but for those who can see it, this is an example of the special microscope we use. You can see it scans through the retina. You can see it lifting up there. That's the uh, saline going underneath the retina. And then gene therapy is injected underneath the retina as well. And that's how the eyeball sort of looks during surgery. And you can see the retina lifting up there like a blister as the gene therapy goes underneath. All right, so that was just a quick sort of um, example of, um, th that was a surgeon's sort of view. That's what, that's what we see when we're looking down while we're operating, we put little instruments inside the eye. Uh, some, some, an, orth, an orthopedic surgeon once told me that he thought vitro-retinal surgery, which is, which is what you just saw, he said vitro-retinal surgery um, is like doing a laparoscopy, you know, keyhole surgery, which is done on the abdomen. So it's like doing a laparoscopy on a Barbie doll because <laughs> you use these very tiny little ports and put your tiny little instruments inside the eye. But once you're in there, it's a spectacular view and it really sometimes feels like you're landing on the moon. You know, you've got this very wide angle view of the whole retina. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful to see. So there's an increasing number of genes being discovered all the time. We're up to over 250, 250 different genes. As you can imagine, if we have to develop a new treatment for every single one of these, it's a mammoth task ahead of us. But there's a huge amount of excitement and momentum behind uh, the research in this field. And I think we're going to get there at some point. It may be that as time goes by, we develop new strategies. Perhaps there's a, 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 um, a, a more generic treatment that can be given to patients in addition to or instead of these gene specific treatments but it is a huge task and it's um you know really the first step is to work out what gene you've got and uh and then go online and see what's what's happening with research in that in that area um and so to that end really you know you, you, i suppose at this stage you'll be you'll be really hoping actually that you've got a gene that's sort of one of these genes listed in this table here which is sort of the, the, the sort of, uh, it's a bit like a most wanted, uh, you know, sort of list. Uh, and, and these are the patients that we're most interested to get to know and, and, to, and, and in whom to make a genetic diagnosis because there are studies in the pipeline 
clinical trials in the pipeline for diseases like choroideremia. That's a, that's a, that's a, at the pivotal trial phase three trial stage. Uh, X-linked retinoschisis, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. That's another big one coming down the pipeline. Stargardt's disease caused by mutations in the ABCA4 gene. Uh, that's that's really the most the most common macular uh, dystrophy. So you, it's either a, you you sort of get lucky in a way, and you've perhaps got a rare gene mutation like RP65, which is one treated by Luxterna, but one that is the target of a treatment, or you may have a more common um, inherited retinal disease like Stargardt's disease, which whilst it's not quite yet at the stage of a treatment, because it's common, there's a lot of research going on. Um, into, into developing a gene therapy approach. And just as, a, as an aside, the tricky thing with ABCA4 is it's too big, the gene's too big to fit inside the, uh, the virus that we're currently using. So they're developing novel approaches to uh, get around that issue. Um, so there is, a, there is a, currently a sort of a size limit. It's a bit like, you know, if you want to fly a Jetstar and you're not allowed to take your hand luggage on unless it can fit inside that minuscule little cage that they make you sh sh shove your bags into. I mean, that's sort of the sort of thing, uh, that's some way of thinking about genes at the moment. Uh, so, so hopefully we can all upgrade to something more like a Qantas or even a, a full, fully fledged cargo ship to get genes into the retina. And that's, that'll be, you know, work to come in the future. So here's a slide that's showing that hit list I was just kind of referring to. So... RP, RPE65, that's the name of the gene that is um, in which a working copy is given uh, with Luxterna. Choroideremia, as I said, uh, that's X-linked, so that tends to affect males, although it can sometimes affect females. Retinitis pigmentosa, well, that's a catch-all phrase, of course, as you, as you all know, for a number of different rod dystrophies and rod cone dystrophies, but the key ones there, RPGR, which is an X-linked form, most common X-linked form, that is, that is coming, that will be that will very likely be coming to Australia in the next couple of years in the form of a clinical trial. Um, our research group is working on a, a, a disease called Bietti crystalline dystrophy, and of course, Stargardt's caused by ABCA4 I mentioned. So these are the ones we're most interested in. It's a tricky balance actually, because of course, Lauren and, and I are most interested in sort of seeing everyone, but we had, we had some media uh, um, coverage of our work the other day and the floodgates opened and and we had a lot of inquiries, which is fantastic, but we are going to have to, uh, just through the sheer logistics, try to identify the genes as a first step. And then for those who, in whom we know there are clinical trials coming or research coming, that'll be the ones we'll be focusing, focusing our primary attention on. And, and the, the ones that perhaps are, are not the focus of research yet, We'll log in our registry, and when we get patients, when we get rather um, colleagues from overseas or locally coming up to us and saying, "How many patients have you got with this gene or that gene?" We can't find many patients with, with this particular gene. We've got something really exciting, then we can pull up our registry and say, "Well, oh, actually, we've got quite a few," and uh, that's wonderful to for us to know that because um, we can we can communicate that to these these uh, individuals and, and and ask if they'd like to get involved. And so that leads on really to this next slide here, which is. Um, all about getting genetic testing done. What's involved? What is it? How do you do it? And there's this great um, resource online called Know Your Code. Um, there's a link here, and I'm sure um, um, uh, Leighton will be able to share this um, to the group. But it's a nice, nice website. So sort of talks you through what what's involved with genetic testing, and um, it's a sort of an international um, retinal international um, funded uh, website. And then sort of thinking more locally. You know, if, certainly if you're in Victoria, we've got this new uh, ocular genetics clinic that's been set up. Um, it's a public clinic at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. And that's, um, what, you know, going wonderfully well. It's a sort of one-stop shop approach where you can see an ophthalmologist who, who, who knows about inherited retinal diseases. And also you can see the clinical geneticist. That's a doctor who's specialised in genetics. And then also, if need be, a genetics counsellor. You can come in, you can do from start to finish, get the whole a whole sort of assessment done, have your blood sent off for genetic testing, and then sort of come back in a few months time. And, you know, there's usually a 70 to 80% chance we will have found the gene. And if we can't find it, then we'll test it again in a few years time. And hopefully with the discovery of more genes, we might be able to, uh, to identify it. And so that's, that's a wonderful service here in, in, um, in Victoria. And of course, in Perth, there's the Lions Eye Institute, um, which are very active in this field as well, and the Sydney Eye Hospital. 
um, it has also got a, um, a very um, um, high level of interest in um, inherited retinal diseases with Paul, Paul uh, with uh, John Grigg and um, Robin Jamison there. And uh, so, so all around uh, the country, there are centres and specialists with interest in inherited retinal diseases. And if, if the first step probably is to see your ophthalmologist, talk to them about your inherited retinal disease. They may, um, if they're a little old fashioned, perhaps uh, not be fully up to speed with what's been going on in this field and you can educate them and, and suggest a few things to them. And, and one of those things might be that if you haven't had genetic testing that you might like, you might like to um, pursue that. And, um, and that's, that's, that's sort of the start of the conversation. And of course, uh, there's the Australian Head Retinal Disease Register, uh, which is run out of the Lions Eye Institute. And they've been slowly, uh, like avid stamp collectors, collecting and, and documenting and cataloguing a huge number of Australian um, individuals with inherited retinal diseases and slowly um, building up a, a wonderful range of genes and berries. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful uh, uh, resource for, for research if those patients have nominated uh, themselves as being sort of uh, approachable and, and willing to get involved. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, Lauren has done a huge amount of work in setting up this natural history study of inherited diseases. It's the first step, of course, is to work out what the gene is. But the next step is to, to, to better understand the genotype-phenotype correlation. So how does the gene change match up with the phenotype or you know, how the disease actually looks and manifests and, and changes over time, what natural history means, you're watching, watching over time. And you know that's that is I can't tell you how valuable a, a, a resource that is for patients to be able to say, well, what what's going to happen to my disease? Well, and we, then we can say, well, we've we've been following a, a group of patients with your very mutation, and, and this is what we found. Uh, and so that's great for patients, and it's great for us because w w if a treatment comes along, we can say, well, we've got a bunch of patients here who we've been following for a while, and we know all about them. Here are the, here are some lovely pictures that we've got. If you if if we can ask them if they want to get in involved um, you know they're ready to go so it's a, it's a really fantastic initiative that lauren's been leading and um we're, we're very excited about it and but of course it doesn't work unless patients are, or participants are, uh, are putting their hand up to get involved so we certainly welcome people um getting involved and without going on for too much longer i'll probably uh say that's um enough from me and i think we're happy to take some questions um if that's if that's the right time for that uh Leighton. Yes, it is the right time. Um, so now we have a question. We just need you to raise your hand and then we can turn on your microphone so that you can ask. We did have one question from somebody just wanting to check that the um, genetics, the, the uh, genetics clinic at the Iron Ear Hospital, is that currently open? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you mean because of COVID? Yeah, well, it's a good question, actually. We've, right. we've been trying as much as We've been trying as much as possible to um, run things normally, but uh, the clinic has, for a period of months, been just done by telehealth, uh, which is good in many ways, actually. You know, people with low vision, it's, it's sometimes, you know, a real exercise to get into a clinic and you've got to navigate car parks and all this sort of rigmarole. The tele teleconference model is actually quite good in some ways, but in other ways, it's not so good because really, to you can't look into the back of someone's eye over a Zoom conference. So, um, so that's the downside. You know, patients at some point need to come in and have all the photos and things done, which are so important for us to make the diagnosis. And then, of course, to have a in what some cases can be an emotional conversation, um, a uh, you know. A, 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 a conversation that is best done face to face. You know, someone who perhaps didn't even know that, that, that they had a diagnosis of an inherited retinal disease. That kind of thing is best done face to face. And so the clinic is now transitioning back, I think, out of this telehealth model to more face to face stuff. But it's it's slow. I mean, we're sort of guided by the government restrictions and stuff at the moment. Okay. So we've got a question from Robert Kraft. Um, if you unmute yourself, Robert, you should be ready to go. All right, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, just to uh, Dr. Tom Edwards. Uh, yeah, just a question on uh, the genetics, uh, genetic banks that you mentioned. There is uh, information sort of in Melbourne and in Perth, I think you said in Sydney as well. 
are they each of those banks of um, of uh, data and information shared between all different centres, so that if you are looking for a particular person with a particular gene, you are looking at all the different banks, or are you looking at one or two? It's a good question, and it's perhaps not as streamlined as we'd like it to be, but the logistics of setting that up, uh, you know, are not straightforward, as I'm, as I'm sure Lauren would agree. At the moment, it's done a bit more informally. The, the, each centre has its own cohorts, I suppose, uh, and registries and things. And, for example, I might say, right, I'm really interested in, you know, Vietti's crystalline dystrophy. And I would just sort of informally, you know, contact people in the different centres and say, you know, look, have you seen many of these sorts of patients? Would you mind, if, and if you have, would you mind asking them if they'd be interested in getting involved? So, so that's the kind of model at the moment. But, but, but Lauren, Lauren, you know, and, and of course, we all would like to have something that perhaps is more integrated. And Lauren might wish to speak to this, but it, but it is a tricky thing to set up. But certainly, that's our, I think that's our goal, Lauren, would you say? Yeah, look, I completely agree. So, yeah, look, Robert, we're, um, that's, that's our end goal, I think, is to have that national database where we can have that smooth sharing of data. At the moment, um, I guess our intermittent step, um, what we've done is we have worked with all of the groups across Australia to have the same testing protocols. So we want, it's really important that we take the same sorts of pictures and we do the same sorts of vision tests and things so that if we're looking for people with a particular type of eye disease that you know we've got similar data to share. So that's what we're up to at the moment is working mainly with Perth and Sydney um, and also doctors in uh, New Zealand to try and make sure that we're, we're capturing the same information. Thank you. That's a good point. It's very annoying if you if someone says, "Oh, yeah, I've got some great pictures," and they're in some different format that's not the same as what you've got. So <laughs> like, it might sound like a basic thing, but that is like such a critical foundation thing that Lauren's been putting in place. Okay, thank, thank you. Robert. And now we've got um, Jeremy D'Souza. You just need to up. Yep. Thank you, Sally. Um, this, this, I've got a few questions actually, um, mainly because I don't actually have uh, an inherited um, Brendan disease and I'm still a long way off from my, um, earning my uh, junior ophthalmologist badge, so excuse me if I ask some silly questions. Um, the first one's uh, to Dr. Aiton, uh, really around the, um, the editing process, which I think is amazing. I don't think that was possible, but where do you get the right version of? You say if to take the, I guess the damaged bit out when you ed when you edit, where do you get the right uh, version from? Yeah, so that, that's where it gets very exciting actually, because they can be manufactured in a lab, so it's actually possible to to make make correct versions of genes. So that, that's actually quite simple. As Tom mentioned, it's probably the, one of the biggest challenges at the moment is often the genes that we want to replace are, are too big. And so that's really one of the biggest challenges is how, how do you get that into the eye? And so it's looking at different types of viruses to get that in, the, the, um, the genes into the eye or also using potentially other ways of, of getting the gene in. And so it's things like, um, for example, lipids, so, so fat molecules might be an option. Um, they're looking at certain types of metals, for example, but it's um, definitely a challenge. Thank you uh, for that one. And we talked uh, a bit about the low surgical risk, but there's an uncertainty in terms of reliability. What drives that uh, uncertainty or lack of reliability? Um, well, I, I suppose it's all relative. I mean, the, the, the certainty around the, you know, you know in the virus you've got the right copy of the gene, you know you've got the, the, the virus is just right, you've got, you know, there's been so much work getting everything up until that point right. You then go into a more dynamic situation of being in someone's eye, every eye is a bit different, you know, the, I guess the point I was trying to make is that the surgery is the least reliable, relatively speaking, the least, the least reliable step of that whole chain. Uh, but, but, but that reliability is improving all the time. I don't, I don't want to make it sound as though it's, you know, um, you know, uh, not, not safe or, or not reproducible. You know, it, it's been done hundreds of times now in, in, around the world, but I suppose it's, it's all about 
any anything in surgery has some degree of um, you know it's a dynamic process. It may be that one person's retina doesn't doesn't detach in quite the same way as another person's retina does. But we're getting getting better and better at that and understanding how how to detach the retina and how to inject it safely underneath how to inject the virus safely underneath the retina. So it's a I guess the range of variables that um, may be involved lead to that. Yeah, I mean, like, for example, I was involved in a study when I was in Oxford on using a robot to do that step. You know, uh, so it's innovations like that that will lead to more standardization and more re repeatability of, of, the, of the process. I mean, um, you know, the, the robot was holding, was holding the cannula tip so still that you could actually uh, see the eye pulsating slightly with the patient's heartbeat. You know, and, and no one had ever seen that before because you're just not ever holding the stitch, holding things so st still. Um, and, you know, we, we asked the anaesthetist if he could do something about that, and <laughs> he said, obviously not. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I don't know how you do it. That was an amazing thing. It's probably easier from uh, what I can see uh, on the camera there. Um, my next one uh, question is uh, really to help me understand in terms of the different drug for every genetic cause. So uh, if they have to come up with a new new drug for each gene to identify, are we talking about from development right through the full testing regime for each new drug? Well, to, to a degree, yes. Uh, um, certainly Luxterna being the first had was the icebreaker, if you like. And as regulators and ethics committees and other approval bodies become more familiar, they, I think, will perhaps be a little less um, concerned about the safety profile, for example. I mean, they're all using the same, at this stage, they're all using the same type of virus. It's just a different gene and some variation in some of the elements around the gene. So, but, but you know, basically for every drug that's going to come on the market that, that is, you know, gene therapy sort of based drug, you, you will have needed to have done a huge body of work in, in the laboratory in cells in a dish. And then you'll often have had to have got shown uh, safety in animal models. Uh, and then, you know, you'll eventually then get on to human clinical trial. So even though it may well be that the only difference is it's a different gene and everything else is very similar. So that, that's why it's so slow. You, know, you can see why that's so slow and, and why it is, they're charging so much for these things. There's so much work that goes into de developing the drugs. Yeah, it certainly um, is eye-opening uh, for the degree of all that needs to be done. I guess that also is a reason why getting genetic testing is um, uh, so significant in the overall process to, to know the availability of what's there now and what's coming. Okay, Jeremy, did you have any more or is that it? Just last one, sir. Um, yep. In terms of genetic testing, uh, is it still cost prohibitive? Uh, and it sounds like it's available across the country. Is it still quite cost prohibitive or is the government subsidised or where are we at with that? Yeah, well, at, in the genetic, at the Ocular Genetics Clinic, I can speak you know, to, from the Victorian perspective, you know, it's, it's, it's paid for by the government. So they've given us a pot of money to spend each year, uh, and and so we we can those patients we, we can pay and cover the cost of it. It's about twelve hundred dollars, give or take, Australian to do most most testing. If so, if you were to go privately, for example, see see someone in see a, a you know, clinical geneticist privately, uh, and and the pathway would have been you see the ophthalmologist, you've said look I'd like to see someone privately and then you get referred to see a clinical geneticist, then um, one pathway there would be if there was no prospect of it being subsidised by whatever health, whatever health care service they were associated with, it may be that that would be something that you would pay for. And as I said, around you'd be looking at around $1,200 or so. So the cost is coming down all the time and I expect it would continue to come down. Um, Yep. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you both for your presentation. Yeah, it certainly opened my eyes, uh, excuse the pun, for um, 
you know, in terms of my knowledge around this area. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so the next question is from Scott Grimley. You just need to unmute yourself, Scott. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Good, you can hear me. Actually, um, it's a two-parter question. Um, the Lax Turner inf uh, gene therapy, I read about that when it first came out and there was estimates of it lasting maybe five years, maybe a bit longer. I'm just wondering if that was correct, but also if that is correct, how does that justify the eye-watering cost that Lux Turner first put out of nearly a million dollars US um, because that was the potential income people could make after getting the treatment? I'm not sure where that figure. Oh, thank, thanks very much for your question. I'm, I'm not. I probably couldn't speak to the question uh, regarding how long it would last. Um, you know that 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 number you quoted of it being five years. I mean, I th I think they're certainly anticipating that it, this would be a lifelong uh, single treatment, but ultimately they won't know until. Uh, you know, patients have had the treatment in their eye for a period of time. There's only, it gets to a point at which you, you just can't know this stuff until you, uh, you know, start using it. And whilst I completely agree without a guarantee that it would last lifelong, you might question, the, 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 you know, to some extent, the, the, the price tag. Um, but, but, I mean, that's, that's, that's what's been negotiated and that's, that's the current situation. Um, but I expect over time these, these prices will come down as there's more competitors in, in the markets and, you know, like that plasma screen example I gave you, but. Um, I, can, I can probably add a little bit to that too, Scott. So um, I think probably where that came from, there was actually a young boy who was one in one of the first clinical trials and they actually wrote a book about him. It was called The Forever Fix. And he um, did very, very well of the treatment and then um, started to lose his vision again. And they actually retreated him and it, he ended up doing quite well. And what they think it was, was just the dosage wasn't quite right because um, he was very early in the clinical trial stages. Um, so that, because that definitely at the time caused a fair bit of media. So I'd say that's probably where that number came from. Okay, thank you. I was only reading mainstream um, news articles on Apple news streams and the like. Yeah, and sure. It was ex estimated five to eight years that gene therapy would last. And there was reports of anywhere from a million to 1.5 million being charged for the treatment, uh, which seemed a bit sort of excessive for a treatment that could last five or eight years. And apparently when the CEO of Lux Turner was questioned on that, his comment was that this was the potential income people could then make once they'd had the gene therapy. I don't know whether it was true or not because I couldn't find it anywhere else except for the one article. I just wanted to question. Yeah, yeah. No, like I, th I think Tom's point's completely right, but the price of that will come down. Uh, and the other thing is obviously things like Medicare and, and, you know, government support means that people won't be looking at paying that much themselves, um, but it's not sustainable. They're, they're really high price tags. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, we've also got a written question here from Cameron. Um, and he asks, what can we do to support research and progression of gene therapy treatment in Australia? If petitioning politicians, what should we ask for? That's a great, I'm, I'm gonna jump in there, Tom. Um, look, that's, that's a great, look, to be honest, um, the work that Retina Australia and the members do already is amazing for our work because it means that when we talk to, to government and politicians and funding bodies, um, that we have somewhere to direct them. Um, in terms of individual impact, getting involved in some of these studies is really important at the moment. If we can try and find, you know, the genetic, um, I guess, distributions that we have in Australia. So if we can learn more about what, genes are out there and, and those sorts of things, that'll be really powerful. Um, in terms of petitioning government and things like that, it's usually really powerful when it's led by someone like Retina Australia. So it's obviously talking to Legion and talking to the team about, you know, the best way to approach. Um, but that's yeah, something that we're very, very keen to work with, with people on. Great, thank you. Um, and now we've got Anne with a question. Just, okay, Anne. 
you just need to unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Um, look, I was just wondering if there's an optimal age for both becoming involved in research or treatments and whether um, there's a, an age at which it's no longer of any purpose to begin treatment. I mean, I, I would, thanks very much for your question. It's a good one. And I would say really no restrictions on age uh, at the early stage of an IRD or at, at, at the advanced stages where we're interested to learn more about the full spectrum because people have needs at all, that, all, all points along that progression um, and different ages. Uh, but presumably you don't want to risk a, a young child in your research? No, well, I was just going to go on to say it, it, it also depends on um, you know, logistics and you know time and, and sort of family dynamics and things, and, and and you'd like it to be a choice that's made by um by the individual themselves. I mean, for young children, really the emphasis is on sort of them getting on and leading their life as normally as possible. Um, but certainly, if they if they were to have, been identified as someone with a, with a gene mutation for which there was a gene therapy, then you, you would wish to know about that at, at a relatively early stage because you then start giving some thought towards the timing of any intervention if, if that was appropriate and, and what they wanted. But from the point of view of sort of just natural history studies and Lauren's work there, Lauren, would, would you not agree? Essentially, if people are interested and, and, and want to get involved, then really any age is probably. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah, look, we're, we're all happy to see people of any age. Um, so my team have experience with paediatrics as well. So we are sort of used to doing vision tests in kids. Um, but yeah, like Tom said, I mean, the, the tricky thing is obviously, um, you know, a lot of the testing we do and the photos and things, you know, it's easier to take when you're an adult, you know. Um, but for example, Luxterna has been used in children as young as four years of age. So there are treatments that are coming up that will be good for young children. So it's sort of good for us to know that, that people are, are out there and interested in emerging technologies. Mm, thank you. Right, so I've got a question. Um, I, I'm just interested to know how, how do researchers decide on which gene to, to actually use as a topic? I'm interested that um, is this one for Luxterna is only um, seen in 4% of all RP cases, if I'm right, is it because the genes are so widely spread um, that there are very few um, gene um, abnormalities that exist in a good percentage of people with the condition? Does that make sense? It's a, it's a good question. And um, there's lots of different things, you, lots of different filters, if you like, that, that you would pass all the genes through to get down to uh, the ones that perhaps are at the top of the list. Uh, one filter would be how, how common it is. Mm. Now you, you, if you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck, you'd pick one that's more common. So ABCA4 would be in that group. It's not there yet with the treatment, but certainly there's a lot of interest in that. But the downside there is the gene's quite big and that makes it more challenging. So another filter might, might be the size of the gene, picking the ones that are, that are a little on the smaller side then filtered by that you probably get a bunch of genes that were really rare and not many people um, had those and that's a bit more like rp65 and then another filter might be the ease at which you might detect or identify patients with that gene because a lot of rp looks the same i mean you look at a patient with rp and you there's no it could be one of 200 genes so then you it's really hard a bit like finding a needle in a haystack trying to try and find a patient so you might pick a gene you might filter by those that have more distinctive, a more distinctive appearance or clinical presentation, that might be their mode of inheritance. Like they might be X-linked, which means it tends to, to only affect men. You know, and you can uh, you can pick that up quite quickly if, with a, with a good history. Um, or it might be that it has a very striking appearance when looking at the back of the eye, like choroideremia, which is also X-linked. So that was probably the reason why they looked at choroideremia. It ticked lots of boxes. It's small, it's X-linked, and it's it's unmistakable when you look at the back of the eye. So that made choroideremia right up near the top of the list, not because it's necessarily common as such. So it's, it's all these sort of things that go together. Great. Well, I think, we've, I think everybody has um, 
had a fantastic opportunity to say um, to ask you their questions. Um, and now I just want to introduce Peter uh, Mars, who's a member of the Britain Australia Board, to um, to say a few words to, um, at the end. Thank you, uh, speakers. Firstly, thanks very much to both uh, uh, Lauren and Tom for coming along or uh, uh, giving us their time this afternoon to uh, give us this knowledge, which has been. And I've read, made some notes here, and it's just uh, occurred to me there's a number of puns that come up in all this when we talk about enlightening, shedding more light, uh, opened our eyes, and eye-watering um, costs, etc. Mind you, I can't think of anything more eye-watering than the surgery that goes into uh, into injecting things like Lux Turner. But there you go. I found it in in <laughs> enlightening. Um, I, as a sufferer of uh, uh, RP. I have done a little bit of research myself to find out some basic information, but I've got a load more today uh, from you two, and no doubt there's lots more to be got. So I'm a bit sorry that this session's coming to an end. However, having said that, um, your presentation has been uh, spectacular for me, and I imagine for the others, it's uh, uh, given us a lot of um, food for thought and a bit of a picture of what's happening worldwide. And I had no idea that, um, you, I mean, you described it where we're at an exciting stage now. I knew about Lux Turner, of course, but I had no idea others were on the cusp of being um, produced or tested uh, you know, in clinical trials and so on. So thank you very much uh, from all of us. And uh, hopefully uh, we can see you and listen to you again soon. It's, um, it's been very interesting. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, so finally, that's, that's really everything for us today. Um, and I want to just say thank you to all the people who've attended this um, session. Um, we had over 50 registrations, which is fantastic. Um, and we also have a number of new members who joined just for this event. And we look forward to working with you uh, over the, in the future. Um, we would like to have more of these events in the future. And so we've set up a survey that you will, when you leave this screen, um, you'll be taken to the survey, and if you have time to fill it in now, that would be wonderful. Um, but if you don't, we'll be sharing a recording of this um, in the next day or so, and there'll be a link to the survey there as well. And it's really a great help to us to get your feedback and hear about what laws are on the event, and hear about any ideas you might have about future events. So that's the end of this, the uh, webinar, and I want to say thank you very much to everybody, and have a